a new series out this week. We've got her visit with our third hour friends, plus Euphoria, the buzzy show about a group of troubled teens raked up 16 Emmy nominations this year. We spoke with the cast about how their characters evolved this season. And we'll wrap things up with the late, great James Caan from our vault on one of his most iconic films, Misery. But first, here's today's pop start with Jacob. Let's do some pop start. All right, first up, we've got an exclusive first look at the upcoming Princess Diana documentary, simply called The Princess. The film's going to give viewers an intimate look at Diana's life and how her relationship with Prince Charles came under intense scrutiny from the media and the public. Watch us. The princess has been the best thing that happened to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. Prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. Just give me one question, right? Like, no. She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Thanks. Leave them alone. Should this mean so much to us? Intense, right? Ooh, I have anxiety. Wow. Amazing. Oh, I know. Wow. I can't wait to watch that one. So, Prin the Princess premieres on HBO the 13th of August. Okay. So, can't wait for that one. Oh, yeah. uh, coming up next, uh, any Dawson's Creek fans? <laughs> yes. Raise your hand. I <laughs> love the Dawson's Creek. Uh, we got some news on a possible revival of the popular 90s teen drama that starred Katie Holmes and James Vanderbeek, Michelle Williams, Joshua Jackson. The news is, this is not fair, it's likely never going to happen. <laughs> Why you bring it up? I don't know. I just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, Holmes was asked whether she would like to return to the role that made her a household name. She had some disappointing news for fans. This is what she said. I think it's great that you're nostalgic for it. So am I. But it's like, do we want to see them not at that age? Mm. I I don't know. I don't think so. We all decided we don't, actually. So, okay, there you go. Pretty that's definitive. Pretty definitive. I don't want to know what happened to them, like, as adults. Did you love maybe? Katie Holmes? Oh, my Come goodness. on. Yeah, yeah. Is that was that your crush? crush? I would go that was your crush. I'd be like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, okay, next up, Lizzo. Uh, how was the show? It was an absolutely incredible. Fresh off uh, being here and her hit song about damn time, hitting number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The music superstar is revealing just how many times she recorded that song's chorus to make Make it perfect. She posted a TikTok video of the moment that she nailed it with members of her team celebrating. Check it out. Huh. The moment I finally figured out the chorus to about damn time. Let's celebrate. I got a feeling I'm going to be okay. Okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Oh, is that amazing? That's awesome. Is that amazing? That's so fun. she wrote in the caption, we literally had 50 versions of the song. I never thought we'd finish it, wow. but it was worth it. Can you imagine being in that room? Do you remember when she was here, I won't forget, when she was greeting all the people in the crowd and this little girl looked at her and said, I love you, Lizzo. And Lizzo said, I love you. But do you love you? Oh, oh. she said yes. I was Whoa. like, I love that Lizzo. She's oh amazing. Gosh. I bet that kid will never forget that moment. Yeah, I, had, I was texting all of you. I got had FOMO that day. That was yeah, like one of the good Also, the here. entire yeah. album is great. Yeah, that is great. Entire album yeah. every track. Well, if it wasn't enough, she also showed a video uh, showing off a bouquet of flowers, by the way, that Harry Styles <gasps> sent her way as a congratulations Aww. about damn time. It actually surpassed, dethroned as it was oh, on the Bill song. Oh, yeah. oh, that's okay. classic. I love Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, have you ever been watching Seinfeld? This is all about me, guys. <laughs> uh, and thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could have that marble rye bread or that famous <laughs> big salad. Yeah. Well, now you can, thanks to the release of the official <laughs> Seinfeld oh cookbook. No. Yeah. Yes, it features recipes from some of the show's oh classic God. food moments, from the black and white yeah. cookie to the infamous soup Nazis, what? Mola Gatani. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, 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 one Mola Gatani, and, um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Al Pacino? You know, scent of a woman. Hooah! <laughs> Hooah! <laughs> 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 Very good. Very good. You know something? No soup for you! Come back. One year. 
One year. One year. Back one year. <laughs> no soup for you. Yosef was so excited for that one. I, just, I said Mulgatani. He's like, Sign, we're doing Seinfeld? Uh, you don't have to worry about following the soup Nazis rules because you can make the Mulgatani That's right awesome. at home. Wow. So October cool. 11th, the okay. cookbook comes out, so That's go pick fun. that one so up. Fun. Okay, last but not least, the most unexpected story of the morning. Aaron Rodgers <laughs> rolled into Packers training camp this week looking like a movie, st- actually like a movie character. Look, here he is walking into camp, rocking long hair, <laughs> oh. a beard, a white tank top, light blue jeans. Does he remind you of anybody? Nick Cage. Nick Cage. Oh, Nick Cage. Baby Cage. Oh. Packers fans and yeah. Nick Cage fans <laughs> caught on pretty quickly. He was channeling Cage's character, wow. Cameron Poe, right. from the 1997 Con Air. Yep. It was no coincidence. He posted photos of Cage on his own Instagram, too. So he did this on purpose. And it's not the first time he's done something like this. Last season, Rogers grew out his hair a lot. And it turns out it was for his Halloween costume. So he went as Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, complete with the dog and everything. So wow. he commits. He commits, he commits. yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, that's your pop that's star, it? guys. Yeah, I, want to I know, we're you like, want, we want more. more. Guys, can we get a couple more? Oh, yeah. Well, wow, way to go. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> We've got one more pop star story for you this morning. Get ready for more Ryan Gosling and The Gray Man. The Netflix action film may have just premiered on Netflix, but a sequel starring Gosling is already in the works from the same directors. Not only that, but it seems the streamer is trying to turn this into a whole sort of spy cinematic universe with a spin-off being worked on as well. The Gray Man follows Gosling's CIA agent character as he's hunted by assassins across the globe. Looks like audiences liked what they were seeing with a reported 88 million hours viewed over the weekend. That's a huge number for Netflix. And those are your Pop Start Plus headlines. Still to come, Bonnie Hunt's visit to the third hour. Stay with us. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. (laughs) Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Bonnie Hunt wears many hats in the new Apple TV Plus show, Amber Brown. Executive producer, director, writer, and showrunner. And she dropped by the third hour to chat about the new project. Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screens. Ah, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical Whoa. dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. (laughs) And I can wear these PJs that Dad sent me. (laughs) I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, it's (laughs) very sweet. I'm so excited! Kitty. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, you, and she's, you know, 
a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up. It's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and great, all right? of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a book series, as I mentioned, uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air. Just, uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like my mom instilled in me. And I, it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series. And I hope it touches it people. It comes through. You talked a little bit about your mom. We're so sorry to hear of your loss. I know how close you are, but I know that it was important to her for you to address family, different mm. issues in family. And would yeah. she have just loved oh, this so much? Oh, there's mom yes, with is. her pies. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It, you know, I'm, um, I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. She's well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson so Rose cute. and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because uh, we've got so you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something When are you going to finally you? succeed? Oh, no, <laughs> Give me a break. What's going to stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical... Uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for a second mm. Mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was Return to Me which I wrote or all my talk shows or TV shows whatever it is my energy is oh can I have that effect on somebody at home right it's now escape, so, you right? do it's you good. do man it's oh, great to spend time with you it's so Bonnie. great to see you here yes. yeah, Bonnie thank you so much everybody Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV plus this Friday you got to go check it out great to hear from Bonnie up next Zendaya and her euphoria castmates and what do you love about fatherhood the chaos the learning is climate change one of your top priorities What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. 
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. We are back with a fan favorite. Euphoria did especially well with this year's Emmy nominations. The show tallied 16 in all, including a Best Actress nod for star Zendaya. We spoke to her and the rest of the cast about how their high school characters navigate addiction, identity, love, and more in the most recent season. I had to choose three words to describe Euphoria. A lot of words that could describe euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen, it's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we used this season, which is also different. Um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low. And when it's funny, it's really funny. And when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly and Jules is in, in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which it's gonna be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just wanna be like cute couple, but you know, it's it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls, she'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to wanna be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her kind of make some hard decisions. And I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So you slept over last night? Yeah, so? Are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the, the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to, to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and, and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But 
Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. What if these are like the big moments in life? Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. And I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that. But I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine. It is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge, to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces so that's the gift that i've been given it's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art and such a huge collaboration and every moving part you know it's just insane the scale of of what we're doing the trip but yeah you know you can't even put that feeling into words it's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to to me at least and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. If you haven't watched or want to watch again, you can catch up on Euphoria on HBO. Still to come, we are remembering James Caan with a moment from our vault on one of his greatest films, Misery. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. The entertainment world was shaken when James Caan passed away earlier this month at the age of 82. Today, we'd like to remember his great acting legacy. He visited today back in 1990 to talk about his film, Misery, starred alongside Kathy Bates, who went on to win an Oscar for her performance. Over the years, the books of Stephen King have made for some pretty scary movies, among them The Shining, Carrie, Salem's Lot, Cujo, Firestarter, Creepshow. The latest edition of the list is called Misery. It opens nationwide this week. And our man in Hollywood, Jim Brown, says it brings together an unlikely mix of talents. If it were a true story, it would end up on the front pages of supermarket tabloids. Headline screaming, celebrity author terrorized by biggest fan. But it's only fiction. It's misery from the mind of best-selling novelist Stephen King and brought to the movie screen by writer William Goldman and director Rob Reiner. The romance novelist turned prisoner is James Caan, whose film credits include Cinderella Liberty, Funny Lady, Comes a Horseman, Gardens of Stone, and of course, his Oscar-nominated performance as Sonny Corleone in the original Godfather. Kathy Bates plays his number one fan, Nurse Annie Wilkes, who goes from sympathetic lifesaver to sociopathic demon. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. Please. I think it was a sadistic joke by Rob. You know, he says, let's get the most hyper guy in Hollywood. <laughs> let's get Jimmy and tie him down, you know. You know, ha, ha, ha. You know, every morning he would laugh. How, how about this scene you get in bed, Jimmy, you know. So, yeah, that's, that, it, it became, of all the, the pics I've done, and I've done a lot of physical things, you know. And I, but this was the most physical demanding, physically demanding, a uh, picture because of that, you know, because I was forced not to move. This subject of uh, of the obsessive fan, have you ever encountered anything even remotely like this or known any actor who has? I've really not had uh, any anything remotely close to, to this or anything that touched on uh, on violence. Plus, you know, who's going to fool around with Sonny Corleone? You know what I mean? That's the way they <laughs> <laughs> hey, what are you going to do? Nice college boy, huh? Didn't want to get mixed up in the family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain? Why, because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? What do you think, this is the army where you shoot him a mile away? You got to get him close like this, and bing you blow their brains all over your nice cyber league suit. James Caan was Sonny Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's masterful version of the novel The Godfather. Caan, along with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall, were nominated for supporting Oscars, but lost to Joel Grey in Cabaret. Khan also lost out for any chance to grow old with other members of the family when his character was killed off in spectacular fashion. Now, with Coppola's Godfather 3 due in theaters next month, Khan, who also worked for Coppola in The Rain People and Gardens of Stone, wished the movie maker well. Oh, I have nothing but well wishes for, for Godfather 3. You know, Francis uh, Coppola, of course, is been a friend for a long, long time. And uh, I always root for him. Uh, I don't think they need much help. I don't think they need my wishes even. I think it'll be just great. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free. And Meanwhile, James Caan has his own problems with the dilemma provided by Kathy Bates in Misery, which opens this week. Too much is to say that as they hope for an audience, Misery Loves Company. No, shouldn't do that. 56 pass. James Kahn, such a legend. We're thinking of his family and his friends. That does it for this edition of Pop Start Plus. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us again tomorrow for more. We'll see you then.
I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Dovu and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and I know trends. Each week, I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day Smart Solutions. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock, and today we are back with another episode of Shop All Day. We're bringing you our favorite solutions to everyday problems, like carrying multiple grocery bags in one trip, to keeping your pup hydrated on the go. And you know what to do. Scan that QR code at the corner of your screen to get instant access to all of the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we are sharing with you today. All right, if you are out in the sun enjoying those final weeks of summer, you're gonna wanna pick up this clever find. It is an umbrella hook that keeps all of your items handy, whether you're at the beach or in your backyard. We're over here sharing it on a clothing rack, but it's so cool because it's got this adjustable wraparound design so you could fit it around a bunch of different size poles. And it comes with four hooks, so you can keep everything off the ground, whether it's your hat, your keys, or your sunglasses. It is such a genius little gadget. I love this one. And we cannot forget about our furry friends this summer. I love this dog water bottle when I'm on the go with my pup Rocco. And it's more than just a water bottle for your dog. It also has a built-in bowl that they can drink out of. It's so cool. Let me show you how it works. First, you have to unlock it. And the lock is really cool because it prevents it from spilling out when it's in your bag. You push this button right here and the water comes right out. And then it's a bowl, so your dog can drink out of it. And if they don't finish all the water, all you do is push the button again, tilt this upward, and the water goes right back in. And then you just lock it up to make sure none of the water spills out in your bag. Okay, and this next one is one of my favorite simple solutions on laundry day. It's called the Wad Free for Bed Sheets. And this little gadget makes washing and drying sheets a breeze. Nothing is worse than when you take your sheets out of the dryer and they're still damp. So the gadget attaches to each corner of your sheet to help prevent them from getting tangled, twisted, and balled up, whether you're using it in the washer or the dryer. You can use it on a fitted sheet, on a flat sheet. It's got the four tabs. You just clip it in. The one thing I will know is that the brand recommends using it on a low spin cycle to get the best results. So no more tangled sheets, no more bunched up sheets. This thing is genius. And you know when you always need an extension cord, you can't find it? This is a great one to keep handy at home, and I love it because it's actually a double-ended extension cord with a flat plug so it's flush with the wall so you don't have to worry about it damaging your furniture or hitting anything around. So you could look at it here. It's so long. It's 12 feet total. So you get six feet on either side, and at the end, you get three different outlets. So you have three outlets nearby. So if you wanna use it, you could use it behind the couch, have it on each end to keep those table lamps or floor lamps on. My favorite though is using it on my nightstand. So what I do is I have one behind the bed and either side of the nightstand has three outlets nearby. And next up, we have the click and carry bag carrier. This thing is a small but mighty little helper you're gonna wanna keep in your trunk at all times. It lets you comfortably carry a bunch of bags at once and to use it, it's actually really simple. You just push down here and you twist it. Then you just load up all the bags on either side. Then you just twist it, click, and you're ready to carry. It also has an anti-slip padded handle down here so that you can fit it comfortably over your shoulder or in the palm of your hand. The brand says you can use this with 50 pounds worth of stuff. And what's really great is that if you're not using it for your groceries or those shopping trips, you can use it for sport equipment bags or those large dry cleaning pickups. And moving into the kitchen, the Kitchen Cube is an all-in-one measuring device to make cooking a little bit easier. And with this cube, you don't have to dig through the drawers for measuring spoons or measuring cups because you get 19 different cooking measurements in one genius little cube. It actually has imperial and metric system labeling too, and you could use it with liquids, grains, powders, just about anything you need to measure for cooking your favorite meals. The brand says it's also microwave and dishwasher safe, 
And it's a space saver that's gonna help you cut down on all the kitchen drawer clutter. And this next kitchen gadget you need for meal prepping. It's the Chop to Pot Cutting Board. It's a slim plastic cutting board, but when you squeeze the handle, the sides of the board actually fold up and form a chute for a chopped food to go neatly into the pan or the bowl. This is the perfect example of a simple upgrade that can make a really big difference in the kitchen. Plus, the brand says it's dishwasher safe, which we all know is a must have to make those kitchen chores easier. Okay, and last but certainly not least, if you're whipping up pasta at home, then this could be your new favorite kitchen hack. It's a microwave pasta cooker. This is perfect for the college kids going away or for a home cook looking for a simple solution. Either way, it is specially designed to cook a variety of pasta in just a few minutes in the microwave. So you don't need to wait around to boil water or hover over the stove to prevent the overflow. It's a handy little cooker that the brand says cooks pasta in just 10 minutes. So you fill it up with your pasta, then you fill it up with water and you literally just put it into the microwave. It's also long enough for everybody's favorite pasta, spaghetti. It even has a built-in strainer so that you can make your whole meal with this one little container. Let's run through the products one more time the umbrella hook, the dog water bottle, the wad free for bed sheets, the extension cord, the bag carrier, the kitchen cube, the chop to pot cutting board, and the microwave pasta cooker. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's it for editor's picks. Up next, Mako and Lobu is talking to Skylar Bouchard, who's known for teaching her audience how to create restaurant-worthy recipes at home. She'll even share one of those recipes along with her favorite product picks for the kitchen. Don't go away. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Hi there, welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu and this is Influencer Trends where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. 
And don't forget the QR code in the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Today, we're all about items that offer smart solutions to everyday problems, and we've got you covered with solutions in the kitchen. I'm excited today that we have food blogger Skyla Bouchard joining us. Plus, get ready because she'll be sharing a simple yet restaurant-worthy recipe that is perfect for summer. Skylar, how are you? Hi, Mako. It's so good to see you. I know. I'm so happy that you're here. And listen, I love following you on social media. You've built up quite an impressive following. Tell me about how you got your start. I honestly started a blog about reviewing restaurants when I was in New York. And from there, I taught myself how to cook. This was 10 years ago now. Wow. It evolved. And I'm just so happy to be doing what I do, which is making recipes at home. Listen, they say an overnight success takes 10 years, right? Do you feel like you finally made it at this 10 year mark? I think an overnight success definitely takes 10 years or more. I am making my way there. I'm always improving, but it's amazing what can happen. Yeah, that's so cool. And you're self-taught as well. So you must have been like snooping around at the library, on the web. How did you get all those skills? I bought a lot of culinary textbooks, a baking and pastry textbook. I worked in restaurants, worked with chefs. And honestly, the best teacher is failing and trying at home. And that's how I got here. I love that. Speaking of trying at home, your husband, Sebastian, is not only lucky because he married you, but he's also lucky because he gets to taste these delicious recipes. Does he have a favorite? Honestly, he loves everything. He does like my spicy rigatoni vodka a lot, though. Okay, okay. Is there anything that he doesn't like? Would he tell you or he knows better? If I made him like a crostini with olive tapenade and anchovies, I think he would hate that. But other than that, he's really good. He loves them all. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love seeing that on your social media. Okay, let's dive into this recipe that you're making. This looks, all of it, the ingredients look amazing. We're making a ribboned zucchini salad with peas, pesto, basil, and mozzarella. What do we need to get started? All right, so the first thing we're gonna need is just your average peeler. This is a ribboned zucchini salad. So we're essentially making zucchini noodles that are thick like pepperdelli. And right. we're just gonna peel this just like that, so easy until you get to the core of the zucchini. Now, what's really cool is if you don't want them thick like this, you can just layer the slices and create your own zucchini noodles that are thinner by just cutting them up like that. So you don't need to get that spiralizer or fancy things at the store, you just make your own. That is so cool. And of course you can use your peeler for other things, right? Like carrots, potatoes, all of that. Of course, a, a peeler is one of the most versatile pieces you can have in your kitchen. You can peel carrots, potatoes, of course, zucchini, any piece of produce that you want to get rid of that outer layer that's a little uglier and damaged, use yeah. that peeler for. Also, if you want to cut carrots julienne, one of my favorite tips is to do the same thing. Cut small strips, layer them on top of each other, and then you can cut them into matchsticks. Oh, that is so clever. Little hack. Right? A nice little hack. All right, let's move on to the food chopper. I got to tell you, especially in the summer, being in the kitchen is not my thing. So this food chopper makes it super easy, right? Definitely. So you can use a food chopper for a bunch of different things. I love this one because it's cordless. Right now I'm making a pesto. So I've got some basil, Parmesan, garlic, lemon zest, lemon juice. We have pine nuts, olive oil. And I'm going to also add a little bit of salt here. And look how easy this is. I love this thing so much. You just pop the lid on and you pulse it like that. And this comes with an actual paddle for whipping cream as well. So you can whip cream in your food processor. You can make salsas, you can go chunky, you can go fine. There's a lot you can do with this cordless food processor. It's super versatile. I also like that it doesn't take up a ton of space. Let's move on to the next product. I see these beautiful bowls. Ah, Skylar, I love that we're getting a whole set. How great are these? I love good glass bowls because you can put these in the microwave and that's what I did for the peas in this recipe. I used the glass bowls, I have a tablespoon of water, microwave these for two minutes, you don't have to get a pot dirty, you just make it as easy as possible and then add it to the other glass bowl which has our ribboned zucchini in it. I mean, that is so easy. Can you throw these in the dishwasher too? Oh, absolutely. These are dishwasher safe and they come in a variety of sizes. I see you have them there mm -hmm. uh, with you. And it's great for what they call mise en place, which is setting up your space. As a chef or a cook, you want to have all your ingredients organized. And that's another reason that glass bowls just rock. Oh, 
you're so fancy. I like these little words we're using. All right, so this next item, speaking of fancy, you actually convinced me to buy, and I absolutely love it, the bamboo salt box. Why can't I just use like a regular salt container? Why do we have to put it in the salt box? Well, you know what? This is just a fancy piece that looks beautiful on your counter. It holds your most important ingredient, which is kosher salt. You can also add other spices in here, but it has a very dry interior. Moisture is not going to get caught in the bamboo, so it's a great place to keep your salt. You just always have it on hand. It looks so cute. That's honestly why I love it, but <laughs> you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, perfect, I love it. It looks so fancy when you sprinkle the salt onto it. So now we're just mixing it all together and we also have this squeeze bottle set. Are we using any of those ingredients in our salad? Yep, so I just combined the pesto, the peas, and the zucchini here, all right, in my glass bowl. And then I plated it up just for a swap because we love that. Mm -hmm. Squeeze bottles, oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite pieces to have in your kitchen. For me personally, I'm just gonna top this salad off really quick. I'm adding some mozzarella here, and then I'm gonna add a little lemon zest, and I'm gonna show you where you can get creative with uh -huh. your steam bottle. So, you can go classic olive oil swirl, right? Totally go with that. If you want some heat, swirl a little chili oil in your squeeze bottle. That's a beautiful red spicy garnish. Balsamic glaze, which I did with my little swap out here. So. Needless to say, your squeeze bottles can contain vinaigrettes, oils, glazes, whatever liquid you'd use in the kitchen, and they come with a top so you can keep them in the fridge and just pull them out when you're ready to garnish. Oh, I love that. And this also makes for a great gift too, if you know someone who just maybe moved into their first apartment. This is fantastic. Absolutely. This is for your chef friend, your cooking friend who wants to have that elevated approach. Yes. And honestly, they look so legit on the counter. One final thing I'll say is you can use it to swirl in the pan when you're seasoning your pan. Just one long count is about a tablespoon. Mm. So just keep that in mind. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's a really good tip, a nice hack. Well, Skylar, the salad looks amazing from where I'm sitting. What else are we doing to it? Is it done? Is it ready to be served? It is ready to be served, minus one little thing. It's just a little tip I like to do. I rolled up two basil leaves. I'm just gonna slice them right over the salad. And that is a fun way to not dirty your cutting board and add fresh herbs to whatever dish you might be serving. But of course, for this, it's basil. And that is it. Oh, maybe I'll add a little chili flakes too. What? I love, I love a little heat. I saw them here. I'm like, I need to use them. But that's it. How easy was that recipe? Oh my God, easy. It looks delicious. It's perfect for the summertime. Skylar, thank you for stopping by and sharing that delicious recipe. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. I hope you make it. And I hope you get these products. They're so versatile <laughs> and helpful to have in your kitchen. Definitely will. We'll enjoy. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Pico. All right, now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the vegetable peeler, the food chopper, the mixing bowl set, the bamboo salt box, and the squeeze bottle set. Up next, Chassis Post has problem-solving products that'll not only make your life easier, but will help you get out of the door fast and in style. Don't go away. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who's this? Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this?
Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? I found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and there's nothing we love more than a good problem solver. We found items to help you solve the little problems you encounter every day from a tool that allows you to fasten your own bracelet to a time-saving brow kit. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Let's get started with this genius item that solves a pesky everyday problem. How to clasp a bracelet on your own wrist Meet the Bracelet Helper, a compact and convenient tool that allows you to fasten your own bracelet all by yourself. And it's so easy to use. The tool secures one end of the bracelet, freeing your hand to loop it around the wrist and lock the clasp quickly. Simply hold the tool in the same hand of the wrist on which you plan to wear your bracelet and use the other hand to clasp. Voila! How cool is that? It's made of a sturdy metal and it's great for all ages. You'll never have to say no to that bracelet again. Next, we've got a game-changing beauty solution for anyone who uses hot styling tools like a curling iron and flat iron. Not only will this heat-resistant mat save your countertops from heat damage, but it also doubles as a pouch to store your hot tools immediately after use, even when they're still hot. I mean, talk about a perfect two-in-one travel companion. Just place it on your countertop or makeup table to protect against burns. It measures 11 by 5 inches, which is the perfect size for your favorite tools. And according to the brand, the wave texture, see that here, provides a non-slip surface. And when you're ready to put your tools away and use as a storage pouch, Check this out. Simply open the end and slide the tools inside. How easy is that? <laughs> and I'm not alone in being impressed with this gadget. This is a big favorite of one of our Shop All Day producers who says it just might be one of her best buys of the year. And at around $5, it is hard to beat. Now, on to something to help speed up your makeup routine and perfect your brows. I've been looking for a solution for filling in my brows that is fast and easy. So, when I saw these brow stamp kits from Mad Love, I couldn't wait to try them out. The brow stamp is a full pigment eyebrow pomade that not only fills in brows perfectly every time, but according to the brand, it's also water and sweat resistant. Now, the brow stamp comes with five stencil shapes from full to thin. You just choose your stencil and place over the brow. Then, you take the brow stamp and you dab. I mean, how easy is that? It gives you a gorgeous brow in seconds. And thanks to the stencils, it's easy to repeat the magic again and again, which I really appreciate. I also like that the formula is blendable with a matte finish, so you can go as natural or defined as you want. And you can choose from eight shades, and the kit comes complete with the brow stamp, five stencil shapes, one spoolie brush, and an 
on the go zipper pouch. Now, I absolutely love this next item for solving those little unexpected problems. This is the mini emergency kit by Pinch Provisions, and it's like a first aid kit for any fashion or beauty emergency or wardrobe malfunction. This little kit redefines what it means to be prepared. With 17 beauty, personal care, and style essentials, this adorable petite pouch contains everything a gal needs in a pinch. From earring backs, deodorant towelettes, double-sided tape, and more. The mini emergency kit has thought through every fashion disaster and provided a solution. It's also excellent for travel, weddings, or any event when you really need some backup. It's like having your own personal stylist in a tiny little pouch. And now for a summer solution, we found a clean bug spray that works naturally and doesn't smell like a bug spray. I mean, finally. So if mosquitoes love you, then you're gonna love this plant-based, deep-free mosquito repellent. It's called Golden Hour by Kinfield. And I've been waiting a long time for a brand to come up with a better for you mosquito repellent that smells like a gorgeous perfume. I mean, oh, really does smell so good. I mean, think a little bit citrus, a little bit vanilla. I mean, there's a reason this one keeps selling out and you can use it on both adults and children, but make sure to read the application directions. Next, we've got an innovative find that we discovered on TikTok. And for those of us that suffer from motion sickness, you'll see why this item has racked up millions of views. These wild looking accessories are actually anti-motion sickness glasses. Ah! And though they may look funny, our team tried them out and gave them an A+. Okay, so how do they work? The lensless glasses feature four circular rims, each partially filled with a blue liquid. And the brand says that as your vehicle rises and falls or turns, the liquid in the rims moves too. So it creates an artificial horizon in your field of vision, which resynchronizes the eyes with the balance system. So users have said that not only can these glasses help prevent feelings of motion sickness, but they've even allowed users to read or use their phone while in motion. And that is quite a win. For more info, check out our article on today.com. We even interviewed a doctor about these glasses. They may not work for everyone, but for 20 bucks, they are worth trying. And last but not least, we found a much needed fashion solution for when you're struggling to find the right bra for those backless dresses that are so on trend. Meet the low back bra converter. And this clever solution costs around $10 and will turn any bra into a low back bra. And they're really easy to use. So here's how they work. The low back converter hooks onto your existing bra to pull down the back strap, allowing you to wear those plunging back styles while still having the support and discretion your normal bra affords. The brand says that these bra converters lower your bra band by an average of four inches. So no more having to buy a special bra when you wanna wear a low back style. You can just transform the one you already own. We're showing you the black converter with a nude bra so you can really see how this product works, but they come in three colors to match your bra, beige, black, and an invisible looking clear. So let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the bracelet tool, the hair iron mat, the brow stencil kit, the mini emergency kit, the mosquito repellent, the anti-motion sickness glasses, and the low back bra converter. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on Style Finder and for our show. It's been fun showing you our favorite solutions. Tune in next week for another episode of Shop All Day. Thanks for watching.
There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're gonna prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level obviously is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from gold rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the transcontinental railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, 
arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pika Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple roles of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and you give me plenty of food, I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate <laughs> on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! <laughs> What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, 
Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and taking care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved you, Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Can you update us on the status of negotiations? While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable so much history and so many memories, you know, 
A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I, think, I think, literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we're, we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, uh, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an uh, old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. 
If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, Hello, nice to meet good you. Good to see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah, yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, 
but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, here, the, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Why, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the little Chinese sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa, you've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business.
We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Okay, I have been bursting, bursting to talk to Viola Davis. She is to me just stunning, the kind of person you want to get to know on so many levels. Yes, she is arguably one of the most talented actors in the business, winner of an Academy Award, and now she's only a Grammy away from having the coveted EGOT, the Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. But I couldn't wait to hear from Viola, the woman, the one who survived an unthinkable childhood, the one who witnessed abuse and endured hardship so painful, few people would have survived. But Viola, she overcame, she persevered, and she grew. How? She talks about all of it in her new memoir, Finding Me. Just talking to Viola, I wept in admiration, in awe, and in celebration. Hi, Hoda. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Wait. It's highlighted. It's dog-eared. I bound your book, the PDF, and made a little book out of it so I could carry it with me. Oh. Can I just tell you something? It is so meaningful and beautiful oh. and touching, and um, I don't even know how to describe it, but it moved me to my very core. Thank to you. To my very core. It's so incredible. I mean, Thank I, you, I thought I knew you, and then I read this. <laughs> And now I'm like, wow, I'm so moved. And I'm also kind of mad at myself because I've interviewed so, you so many times and I realized I must not have ever asked the right questions because <laughs> this book is just so full of you. So let me ask you how it feels during this moment. Here you are, you've put your life on the page and you're handing yeah. it out like a piece of your heart and you're mm -hmm. saying, this is me. Yes. Um, how does that part feel in this moment? terrifying it really does it's a lot of it's a lot of fear you know because i'm putting my life out there for the world to uh judge observe you, you know it's it, it's like that old saying i i know what i said i just don't know what you heard and i know what i wrote i just don't know how it's going to be received and i think that that is really ultimately what happens when you make yourself vulnerable it's like running naked in a crowded stadium so it's terrifying well it is um so full of of heart and soul let me just start by saying and i think i speak for a lot of people in america i did not know what you have endured in your life as a young yeah. girl I knew that you had struggles. I did not know you grew up hungry. What does that mean to grow up hungry? The hunger was just one part of it. It's growing up hungry. It's growing up um, exposed to that level of abuse. It's growing up feeling like an outsider. The thing about being hungry is you don't think about anything else. You get to school at eight. By 8.15, you're falling asleep. You're listening to people who say, oh, my mom made me breakfast this morning. I didn't want that cereal. And you're thinking, you didn't eat your cereal? You had cereal with milk? You know, your brain um, chemistry changes, how you perceive the world changes. And I'll tell you the worst part of all of it is the deep, deep shame. Huh. Because how do you tell someone that you're hungry? Huh. How do you... How, how do you say that to a teacher who's worried about maybe your grades, how you're progressing in class? It's a basic human need that's not being fulfilled and there's so much shame around it because you feel like, why isn't it being fulfilled? There was a line in your book where you said like a, one of your friends came over to your house, opened the fridge and asked if you were moving <laughs> because there was nothing in there. Yeah. How, how did you find food? How did you find your basic needs so you could continue uh, on your day? You find it. You know, what I started to remember because it's memory, right? When you go back and it hits you. Um, it's different almost than nostalgia. Huh. But so the memory is 
people who gave you money on the street. Hmm. I would go up to people and say, do you have a quarter? Hmm. Do you have 50 cents? It's going to soup kitchens, Catholic churches, friendships where you know parents are going to make three meals a day. So you form those uh, friendships. You go over to wow. that house and you wait for the meal. Wow. I mean, there was, there was this other p part of the book. I think it's a chapter you entitled Running. Yeah. And you were literally, as you call it, hunted down <clears throat> by young boys chasing you, yeah. calling you the N-word. You were mm -hmm. like, in a sense, running for your life. Yeah. In those moments, I can't imagine that was happening day after day, that kind of horrific bullying. It, it was day after day. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Now, was I actually running from my life? Would they actually have killed me? I don't know about that. But that's what it felt like. It's mm -hmm. just like anxiety. They say anxiety is just fear of death. What I realized from a very early age was... I was born in a world that I just didn't fit into. And I did not have the language to understand uh, the power of race, mm -hmm. the power of being dark skin, the, the potency mm -hmm. of being different. The power of that is just not how I was defined by those eight or nine boys. It's how the world defined me. <sighs> it's that fear of being black, what black meant. In, that, in this powerful caste system we have of how you treat people based on perceived value and mm -hmm. worth. And I was worthless. Hmm. That's what it told me. I was a child. Children cannot deal with the abstract, mm -hmm. right? We don't have those building blocks. And so it felt like I was running for my life and it, I didn't have any arms to run mm. into. Oh. So I was just <clears throat> running. And when you say no arms to run into, you describe, it's so poetic and sad. It like struck me over and over mm. in my heart. But you even talked about how there weren't enough pages in the book to chronicle all of the fights that went on inside your home, what you were, yeah. what you bore witness to, what you felt helpless. I, I would imagine as a kid watching this in front of you. You do. It's, it's, it's the last of the acceptable violences is domestic violence. Nobody really cares. I, I'll tell you that. I, I think it's a complicated issue to deal with. And um, so what happens is you sort of sweep it under the rug. It becomes your sort of dirty secret. Yeah. But every time you faced it, it is absolutely traumatic. Mm. If I felt like I was running for my life from the eight or nine boys, I felt then I had to go into a home where I was running from my life. Mm. That's what it felt like when I would witness the violence between my mom and dad. And I, 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 I keep remembering these moments of violence that even happened at night in mm. the middle of the street and not one window opened. No one came out to help. And I, 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 and I look back on that now because as a kid, we prayed that no one would see us. Huh. <laughs> huh. God. And then as an adult, I'm looking back and go, why didn't anybody see us or help us? Or did they see us? It becomes that complicated. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. 
Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. What was your survival technique like to live day in and day out in a home that felt like that and to go to school in a situation that felt like that? You had to have some place where you, little Viola, went to to live. How did you transport yourself? Well, little Viola I had a whole technique of leaving my body. It was pretty awesome, by the way. Tell me. Um, I'd always go into the bathroom and I would stay there for the longest time. And I had a whole thing where I just would focus on one part of my body, usually my finger, and I'd shut everything down. Huh. And after a certain amount of time, I literally would leave my body and I'd go up to the ceiling, huh. I'd turn around and I would look at myself. I dreamed, huh. I tried to achieve, and I kept secrets. You kept secrets. I felt like the keeping of the secret, the people not knowing it, sort of helped me to survive. I didn't understand anything um, uh, about secrets actually eroding you. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a part of my vocabulary, my understanding of human emotion. I just felt like if, if no one knew, then how they would see me is based on what I was achieving outside of my house. Uh -huh. I recreated myself. Wow. <laughs> wow. But when you recreate yourself and mm -hmm. another reality from yourself, the danger of that is you also disconnect. Yeah. And that's what I did. I disconnected. Same thing that I did when I sat on the toilet. And the disconnection or like a lot of um, people who go through trauma mm -hmm. when they compartmentalize, yep. which is also not good. Yep. That's what I did. I compartmentalize. I use drive and ambition to replace feeling and vulnerability. Did you ever feel like your stuff was unhealable, like that was just going to be you? Well, I wish I could... Uh, store it away, mm -hmm. but I had to unpack it. Yeah. Here's what I believe. I believe that what connects us is not just the joy, is not just the achievements. It's also the sadness. Yeah. It's also the pain. Yeah. I feel that if I cannot share my pain with someone mm -hmm. else, the pain, the joy, the mm -hmm. achievements, then it's not real connection. But in order for me to share that, for me to have the ability to share that, I have to unpack it. One of the first quotes <clears throat> in your book is about faith. It says, I think human beings must have faith or must look for faith. Otherwise, our life is, is empty. I feel like that constantly saved you. Yeah. Well, absolutely, which is yeah. the belief in things that you cannot see. Yeah. Because there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I was, I didn't have anything else, but I always compare, you know, my life to that image of the first man on earth looking out at the ocean <laughs> and the mountains and the sky, <laughs> and maybe it's raining and there's thunder and lightning and he has no language because this is before language. Yeah. This is before psychology. Yeah. This is before people were named. This is before love or hate yeah. or anything. Yeah. And how then do you figure out life? How then do you figure out meaning? What, how do you communicate in or, anything in order to find it? That's how I felt. I have nothing. I have and chills. so chills right now on me. 
So what you what you then rely yeah. on? See, this is the power of connection. Yes. What you rely on are people who see you, people who really maybe see the pain, see the potential, see the talent, people who just love you, oh. and they carry you. You know, there was a moment obviously that changed your life, and. It was when you flipped on the TV and the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman came on and Miss Cicely oh. Tyson was starring in it. Uh, what, did you, what did young Viola's eyes see in that moment? Magic. Mm. I saw everything. I saw what I wanted to be. Mm. I um, saw my possibilities. I saw my value. I saw it all in her. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> you know, it was a path, a blazing path for me. And listen, like I said, my sister Dolores is an incredible teacher right now. My sister Diane works for the Department of Agriculture in DC. And um, my sister Anita went to business school, whatever. And for all of us, it changed us not even just in the acting field. It lit um, fire inside huh. of us that wasn't in our lives before. Because your sister Dolores, I think it was Dolores who told you, we're not going to live like this. What, I mean, to think that all of these sisters were raised in these really horrific circumstances, yet somehow you grew, all of you. It wasn't like you weren't the one that got out. What was it that was in the family that made that possible for all of the sisters to get out? Well, first of all, you have to define getting out. Mm -hmm. Because I know me, I do have some level of trauma and anxiety from the past. Sure. So getting out in terms of my profession yeah. um, required drive. Yes. Drive is different than growth and healing. Now the getting out, emotionally, getting out is totally different, huh. which is why I wrote the book. You don't get out. That's what happens. You have to reconcile um, and own your story. Hmm. I didn't. I cut it out like it was the fat on an awesome piece of filet mignon. You cut out the fat and you recreate the story that you want to create. Mm. The problem with that is that once again, you make yourself tough. You shut out the dark. You also shut out the light. Mm. And so that's what I realized when I was 28 is that I didn't get out. <laughs> Hoda. <laughs> I didn't. But I, 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 I didn't know how to sort of reconcile it. How did you? Or did you? Ownership. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Yeah. You either own your story or your story owns you. I'm not ashamed of it because I know that every single part of it made me who I am. I'm owning my story so people can be less alone. And I'm also owning my story because I want to love me. Hoda? <laughs> I mean, at some point, I mean, you know, come on. It's like, you know, I'm 56. <laughs> you know, I... I was listening to Alicia Keys' song, I Have a Voice. It's so mm -hmm. powerful. It's with Brandi Carlisle. And every time I hear it, I think to myself, I'm 57, and I think to myself often, like, when did, what took me so long to have it? You know, like, you do all these things in life, and you nod your head, and I had that same epiphany. It's like, am I going to be going to my grave with good enough? That's yeah. all I deserve? When did you, when was it that you knew your worth? When did you know your worth? <laughs> um, 
I'm trying. The only reason why I'm silent is not because I don't have an answer. It's because I'm deciding if I want to say it or not. Because I'm, and I should just say it. It's a work in progress. Yeah. I started the journey in understanding the value of worth when I was 28 years old. Because as much as I said, I don't want to be my mom. I love, love my mom, but I want to be my mom. I realized I was my mom. Huh. She was my imprinter, you know. And I would say by the time I met my husband at 34, 35, I knew that I was worth more than what I was accepting in my life before mm -hmm. that time. I always define my life as, um, or life in general, as a relay race. So your purpose in life is just like a relay race, great runners. Yeah. And each runner runs, runs their leg of the race and they pass a baton onto the next great runner and they run their leg of the race and that's how life goes. Yeah. But man, I just, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing life is about connection, but it's about you. Everything comes from you. So each of those great runners is just you at a different age. <laughs> it's young Viola surviving that path, but getting that baton to 28 year old Viola who says, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it Viola. I'm going to go to Juilliard. I'm going to do this or whatever. I'm going to work in the theater. I'm going to do the best I can or whatever. And then hits a wall and goes, oh my God. I'm going to give it to the 38, 39 year old Viola who's getting married and understands that now I got to now take another entity into consideration. And now I'm at 56 year old Viola. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book one, once again mm -hmm. is because I felt that 54, I was dropping the baton. <laughs> Cause I was looking back too much, but life, that's how I see it. Oh. It's a whole relay race of you. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Now, with your upbringing, and you, you have Genesis, your beautiful yeah. daughter. Were you, as after you got married? Yes, I definitely want kids. No, I definitely don't want kids. I'm not sure what I want to do about kids, given what you had seen. Definitely felt like I didn't want to get married or have children. Yeah. I, I didn't see being alone as not sexy. I thought it was sort yeah. of sexy. Yeah. I would see like Linda Evans uh -huh. at awards shows. And um, I thought that was pretty cool that uh -huh. she went by herself. 
I thought, that's a strong woman. I still feel that way, by the way. Mm-hmm. I hit it. <laughs> you okay. Hit it. I, 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 let's just say that. I hit it. You would say that I've achieved a certain level of success. And then I crashed and burned because I was like, this is it? <laughs> Why is this it? Because I stopped at success and not as significance. Mm. And I remember running into Lorraine Toussaint and I remember asking her, Lorraine, why did you adopt your daughter? Mm. And she paused for the longest time and she said, I didn't want series regular to be on my tombstone. (laughs) Wow. Wow. And it hit me that my entire life has been defined by achievements taking the place of meaning. Mm. Oh, man. I'm so conscious, even with Genesis, that I always want to say, you know, you're not an extension of mommy's dreams. Mm -hmm. She's her own person. But at the same time, I do sort of believe that she's she's my legacy. She's my hope. She's my meaning. I just rewatched your Oscar acceptance speech. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you talked about your parents and you talked about how grateful to God you were that those were the people who were chosen to give birth to you. And after reading your book, I found that so profound, knowing what you had been through. Why did you say that? Here's what I know about my life. What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness, (laughs) radical transformation. Mm -hmm. What I was giving with my parents is an opportunity (laughs) to grow. They gave me that ingredient that could either have killed me or had me grow in a way that some people never experience in their entire lives. Wow. And that's why when I finally ended the book, I ended the book with God kept me exactly where I was yes. at. Yes. Yes. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? One of my favorite paragraphs in the whole book, and there are so many good ones, is this one. The question still echoes, how did I claw my way out? There is no out. Every painful memory, every mentor, every friend and foe served as a chisel, a leap pad that has shaped me. The imperfect but blessed sculpture that is Viola is still growing and still being chiseled. My elixir, I'm no longer ashamed of me. I own everything that has ever happened to me. The parts that were the source of shame are actually my, my warrior fuel. Come on! Come on, that's awesome! That is so awesome! I underlined it. I'm highlighting it when I get the real book. I'm going to keep it by my bed. It is so incredibly beautiful. Um, and again, just lastly, as we wrap up, the title is Finding Me. Have you, have you found her? Oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) I have. 
You know, I told, I, I, I said it, you know, little Viola is celebrating. She's sitting right next to me and mm -hmm. she's happy that she's finally being embraced. Yeah. Well, Viola, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. I've been waiting for this book and people are going to devour this. I think you're going to change. I mean, you've already changed a million people's lives, but I have a feeling you're going to do a lot more with this. Thank, Thank you, so Viola. Much. I adore Thank you. you. Thank you so I much. I'm keeping too, this. I love okay. You. Mm -hmm. I love you. See ya. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for doing this. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting us I'm, in your spot. I'm thrilled that you are all out here in our little store. What is it like to be sitting in a brick and mortar store surrounded by sort of the universe you've created? So much of what you've done is online, obviously, but yeah. to sort of see it all in front of you and have people come in and look and touch and feel. You know, I, I always find it surreal a little bit when I come into a store. And I think even more so now in a post-COVID landscape because our stores were closed for so long and it's so nice to actually, I don't know, come back into a physical space and see customers. And it's such a place of discovery for people and everybody's always smiling when they're in the store. So I, I love coming into the store. That's a good sign. Is there <laughs> one place when they come in later today, they'll go, is it to the candles, the famous candles? Is there something they're really coming in here looking for? I think we have kind of a variety of people who come into the store. You've got like your diehard goop shoppers um, who come always for G label every month or they come to see, you know, our curation. We're kind of known for the curation and assortment. And then there are people who've heard about it in the press who are just curious and are coming in either to see sexual wellness or candles. Um, and then there's the clean beauty, of course, which we're really proud of that whole section and what we'll be able to I don't know, contribute to the clean beauty movement. And so there's always something for everybody here in the store. I didn't realize how long this has been brewing in your head. Mm -hmm. The newsletter's 2008, the company comes a few years later, but sort of at the height of your Hollywood powers 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you were already thinking about something else. Where did that start for you? Well, I think I've always, um, I've always been a person that's been incredibly curious and always wanted to learn and, and that to me is also like learning where the best bagel shop in Sag Harbor is and kind of gathering good information and sharing good information. It's always been my real passion. And I've always been like a pretty discerning customer. So I remember when the internet was kind of first getting going, I couldn't really find anything in the lifestyle space that spoke to me as a customer. And, you know, I didn't trust the travel curations, for example. And so I thought, gosh, it would be so fun to have a site on the internet that kind of had uh, a collection or an aggregation or a curation of really the things that make me excited. So it took me a long time of talking to people, meeting with people, asking questions, even before I just decided to send that very first simple newsletter. It was a good few years in the making. And as you thought about it then, was that sort of, this is my next chapter? after acting or is this a parallel chapter with acting? I describe it as like I'm in my life and I'm doing my thing, but there's some part of me that's preparing for something else <laughs> in my future. And I don't think I was consciously thinking about a next chapter, but I think I was definitely thinking about, um, you know, the years that I had spent doing three, four or five movies a year, traveling all the time, missing my home, missing my friends and family. Um, and also wondering, you know, do I have permission to ask, even ask the question, like, do I, would I want to do something else? Like, would I have the liberty to pursue a different passion? And how, what would that look like? And, and so it was a slow process for me. It definitely was like a leap that I was taking. When you started writing the newsletter, mm -hmm. at what point along that journey did you say, oh, this can be something more? Maybe there's a company in there yeah. somewhere. I think, you know, well, I remember a specific moment when um, I had done a piece on the French pharmacies. So the pharmacies in France are fantastic and they have all these amazing products. I kind of had done an edit of the best of the French pharmacy. And somebody stopped me on the street and said, you know, I love that piece so much. 
I just wish I could have clicked to buy at the end because I was on, you know, Amazon.fr trying to find this and that, and it was such a nightmare. And I, it was the first time that it occurred to me that you could have e-commerce as a service as opposed to just being so transactional, like buy this, buy this, like that a curation was actually valuable and information and someone like going out and doing all the legwork for you could actually be a value proposition. And so that's when I started to think about how e-commerce might might play into this. Did you have people in your life saying, this is nice, Gwyneth, that you're <laughs> doing pretty well with the acting thing. Let's, let's keep our focus here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, not in my immediate life because I think my family and my friends, I think they're used to my, I think what was always a really entrepreneurial spirit, right? I mean, I think when you're an artist, it's very entrepreneurial. You have to believe in yourself so much when nobody else believes in you and you have to visualize that you're going to get somewhere. And it's, it's, so there are a lot of parallels, I think. Um, but definitely, you know, people not closest to me were like, you know, what the hell is she doing? <laughs> Why is she doing this? And, um, which, you know, it's like the story of my life. How did you bump up against those skeptics and, yeah. and deal with some of that criticism? And like being my own worst skeptic in that capacity, right? Not knowing yeah. if I had the ability to run a company and, um, and really having to learn on the fly how to run a company and making so many mistakes, you know, because I hadn't grown up in the world of e-commerce or growth marketing or anything, you know, I had just, I just had passion and an instinct and like, I thought, you know, good taste. And, um, and so I, I set out to do it and I didn't, I didn't set out to run it. When I first started to think about how to monetize it, I thought somebody else, you know, has to do this. So I hired a CEO, a great guy named Seb, who was my first CEO in London. And unfortunately, when I was moving to America, he couldn't move, he was going to come. And it, it, over the next couple of years, I realized like that certainly at the size we were, that I was the right person to run the company. And despite the myriad mistakes that I've made, I still think that that was the right decision up to a point. I mean, you know, I think at a certain point, it's going to be too much for me and I'll hand the, hand the keys to somebody else. But you've got the company this far. Mm -hmm. You've done pretty well with it. <laughs> you don't think you could take it to the next level? Well, it's, it's hard for me to gauge because I, I, I know what I have not known from zero to where we are now and I don't know what I don't know from now mm. into like the next phase. And so, I mean, I ask questions all the time. I call other founders all the time. What should I anticipate? Like what's around the corner? What, how do you really scale after this, you know, point? And I think that I could probably do it to a certain point, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure if I could run it, you know, like if, you know, if we were, I had a even more complex international omni-channel business, like I just don't know that I would be the right person at that point. You're in every meeting, you're making all the decisions. Was that a hard adjustment for you where, oh my gosh, this is all coming back to me at the end? Yeah, for sure. And a scary one. Um, I think when you work at a company like Goop, you you have to assemble a great team around you and, and really, you know, I think the team that we have is amazing and we make decisions collectively, but the buck always stops with me. And I would say it is difficult to be the creative force, the driving force creatively, and to have all these ideas all the time, but also to be the person who's responsible for the P&L. Sometimes those are competing intentions. Yeah. And so it's been, it's been very interesting for me to learn how to adjudicate those things and understand like when it's okay to take a risk and when it's not. And I mean, you never know 100%. I know that as fun and invigorating as it is, there are some really tough days and there are moments where you're like, actually, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I don't know if we're yes. going to get there. Yeah. Did you have several of those moments before you got to this point? I have them all the time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. And especially like having gotten through a pandemic and now there's a looming recession and it's always something and you think like, you know, is this going to be okay? Do, do I have the chops to get us through this? Like, what am I not thinking about? What else, you know, is like, what are the potential landmines? Um, 
And it's funny, I saw something once that said, you know, it's like the creative process and it was like someone ideating or having an idea and it was like, this is brilliant. I am brilliant. I think this is okay. Like, <laughs> I don't think this is okay. This is <laughs> I am <laughs> And then it starts again, you know, it's like, and that's very true. And I think that's just part of the, the seasons of, you know, being a founder and being so close to what you're doing and having to get excited by your own ideas, which is so weird. And then sometimes you think like, this is terrible. Like, why am I doing this? Like, you know, <laughs> but it out. passes. <laughs> yes, I've had many of those days. But then the next day is a good day and you're, you're right back at it, right? Yeah, or the next day, you know, someone, you know, says like, you know, I had a conversation with my daughter about her sexual wellness that I never thought possible and you facilitated that and I'm so grateful because I grew up with all this weird shame around it and now you know and she cited goop like things like that happen and it like makes me cry or someone says you know I found the best restaurant I ever went to and you know on your thing and I met some you know it's like those that that web of meaning that happens when I think you're creating a business from a place of really wanting to help people find great things and, you know, bring them shortcuts and, and bring them amazing quality products, like that happens. So those things always fill me back up and make me think like, okay, I, you know, I'm gonna keep going. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's talk about some of those amazing products. Okay. Some of the ones that get the most attention. Yes. The candle on top there. Mm-hmm. Tell me the story behind the candle, the one that everyone talks about. Yes, I will. We really believe at Goop that um, there are a bunch of taboos that exist that keep women particularly kind of ensconced in shame and out of their power. And so we like to find those paradigms and expose them. The This smells like my vagina. Can I say that on yeah, morning TV? Okay, absolutely. good. So see, we've made yeah, progress. We we've made it's progress. This right is here. great. So that so they're really they're really provocations more than candles. They're meant to sort of take people by surprise and then ask like, what is this? What does this mean? And this is like triggering and why is it triggering? And I think there's a lot of it's certainly when I grew up, there was a lot of shame around our sexuality um, or ambition. And so the, this smells like my vagina candle is really like that provocation to say like, it's amazing to be a woman in every way. It's amazing to have that kind of power and you deserve to have that agency. And so it's just kind of a funny, strong way of, you know, being a provocateur. And you guys have a big focus on pleasure, which I feel like yeah even lately, partly because of you guys, people talk about that more yeah, openly. Like, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a conversation that we started around that very thing, right? Like, what is it like to be a woman who is not afraid of orienting around pleasure? That's It's not selfish. It's beautiful. It's important. You know, whether it doesn't have to be sexual pleasure, but just this idea that, you know, we all deserve pleasure and it's a beautiful part of life, right? And so the sexual piece of that 
you know, sexual wellness is a really new vertical, both at Goop and I think in, in culturally. So I think we're really proud of what we've been able to do culturally and shake that taboo off a bit. So what do you see, whether it's with you at the helm or not, what do you see next for Goop? Well, I think we still, you know, we have a lot of work to do. I think just, again, like having been a startup and made a lot of mistakes, like we're, we're in a really interesting foundational year of like cleaning up a bunch of processes. And I think we, we really are excited to keep kind of introducing the brand to people who might not know about the brand yet. I think that the, the lifestyle aspect is exciting to me as well. You know, that there are multiple ways that you can reach a customer. We just, we, we started a food business that's very nascent yeah. in Los Angeles that's doing extremely well, but I think it's a great way to deliver on the beauty and wellness from a different angle, right? We're always just trying to push further um, and think about the different ways that we can connect with the customer and think about, you know, the exciting products that we have in the pipeline. And there's a lot still left to do. I'm very proud of us and how, where we've been able to get to. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas or my birthday or something. <laughs> Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Do you ever look back, Gwyneth, and say, I left behind, not completely, obviously, but I left behind an incredibly successful <laughs> acting career do you miss that part of your life to be on sets all the time and traveling and doing all those things? No, I don't. I really don't miss it at all. I think I'm so lucky that I got to do it and I still, I'm sure I still will at some point. You know, I did promise my mother that at some point, like if we ever sell the company or if I am not CEO or at some point before I die, I told her that I would go and, you know, do a play. So I'm going to stick, I'm going to, I'm going to okay. deliver on that promise at some point. Okay. When I'm, Get you on Broadway, yes, West End. Yes, that's something. what she would like. Okay. So, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you also, what a gift to be able to have this period in your life with your kids, which I know was yeah. intentional. Has that been maybe even the best part of all this, that you haven't been flying all over the world, that you've been home with the kids? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, especially now that I do have one going off to college, you realize how finite, it just, it went so quickly. And you're right, you know, I used to be, I was, I was talking to my son about this the other day, actually, that I used to be in, I used to take him and his friends in London to a kickboxing class every Wednesday. And I would be editing the newsletter on my iPad because it would go out, you know, Thursday morning. And but I was always there. I was always in this basement in Swiss Cottage in England, you know, like yeah. at the kickboxing. And so I was, I was able to 
be there for most of it, which I really appreciate because, I mean, being on set is amazing, but the hours are long. I mean, you know, sometimes 18 hours. So there were certain times when, when I did do movies, when I had them and I, you know, I would leave the house before they woke up and I would come home after they were already asleep. And that was tough. So I feel very blessed that I've been able to try to pursue this other career and kind of like keep hours, you know, where I'm, I'm able to be home and make them dinner and stuff like that. I was interested to hear you say in another interview that you're almost more comfortable doing this than you were doing movies. You seem so at ease as an actor and you did so well with it. <laughs> But you sort of said, despite you know your parents being in the business, it didn't really feel like home to you. You yeah. didn't love the fame that came with it and all that. What did you mean when you said that? Well, I think it's a few things. I mean, and it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because fame is also incredible and brings with it amazing things and opportunities. And I was able to leverage that to start Goop, and you know I still do in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think. You know, having done now in my corporate life, like having done Myers Briggs a couple times, like I'm an introvert. I always really? test, yes. And so I'm sort of a fake extrovert who's had to get comfortable being, like pretending to be an extrovert, and I'm really not. So I don't love being in front of the camera. I don't love being the center of attention. I hate speaking in public. And I've had to learn all those skills to sort of like prop myself up and do it anyway. But I'm much happier in a much more quiet, private scenario. And I'm much more internal, I think, than people would probably expect. And you were watching your mom, the wonderful Blythe Danner, as a, as a young girl, yes. having a, an exciting life, and playing these incredible parts. Yeah. And so that's probably, right, you were just kind of following exactly. what she was doing. You know, my mother, when I was, I spent so much time sitting, watching her rehearse plays. It was like my, such a giant, part of my childhood and she was just so incredibly powerful and she had such freedom on stage and so I was like well I want to do that as a job because yeah. that looks you know but I, I didn't realize that there were other <laughs> means to that I thought you know you have to be an actress in order to really be real you know self-realize like my mom but and I'm and I wouldn't change anything uh, you know and and especially when I look back on certain times in my life or certain roles or um, certain plays I did or certain movies that, you know, had an impact on people. I'm so happy that I did all of that. You know, that was really special and a very unique life. So when you were coming up trying to be like your mom, it was kind of just for fun. Mm -hmm. What was the point at which you said, oh, this could be my life. This could be my career. My parents always said that I always said I wanted to be an actress from the time I could speak. And so I was very focused on it. And I knew, I knew when I was in high school that I was gonna do it and I was gonna be able to have some success. Like I could feel it, you know? And so I don't know if I could feel it because it was gonna happen or I manifested it because I had that belief, but um, I never questioned it. I, I really, I had a very like strong bullseye, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I was going, moving towards. You went on this incredible run of like, seven Emma sliding doors into Shakespeare in Love where you win the Oscar mm -hmm. and clearly your life is turned upside down. Yeah. The camera's chasing you everywhere. Yeah. What was that transition like in your life? Very overwhelming. It's very intense. You know, there's like a, I, I crossed a threshold at some point. I, I'm, I think it was probably around the time of winning the Oscar where, you know, you go from people kind of being curious about you or discovering you or rooting for you to the whole, to it all being upended and people really wanting to tear you down and take great pleasure in it um, and wanting to know everything about you in a way that can feel really intrusive. And it was really intense. I mean, really, really intense. Totally I had scary days where, at times. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, where you're thinking there's going to be car accidents and people are tapping your phone and writing all kinds of stuff about you that is not true and it's a lot. And it gets away from you. You can't control all that, right? You can't put no. your finger in every hole in the dam. You just have to... Which ends up being a really beautiful lesson because it's really just a microcosm. It's re and it's really just a lesson in knowing who you are, loving the people you love, being totally in integrity and like
everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know you cannot say on morning television. We bleep that. You set the candle. You open the door to whatever. Okay, now. good. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it seems like probably that was part of the reason, too, where you were already thinking about spinning out of acting because you didn't love the extra stuff that came with it, which brought you to this place, to Goop, in some yeah. ways. I think that's true. And of course, like, as I said, you know, I still am the public, like, consumer-facing person for the brand, too. So I have to stay a little bit connected to the public, which is fine. But also, I think that I'm older now, and I'm not doing movies with so much regularity. It's, like, simmered down a bit, which mm -hmm. feels really nice. So when you think, Gwyneth, about the Hollywood side of your life now, mm -hmm. what does it take to get you involved? Because you've done some cool stuff, right? Politician, a bunch of other things. Little, yeah, little bits here and there. I mean, if my husband was doing something and wanted me to do it, I would do it. Mm -hmm. I think I would work with friends if they wanted me, you know, like people that I know and love, and if it wasn't too big of a part kind of a thing. Yep. Um, Iron Man? I mean, if... I don't, I don't, I don't see how that could happen unless it was like a prequel. But then we would be too old, right? <laughs> right, so, right? But sure, I mean, were those fun to drop into and play that cool very character? Fun, very yeah. fun. Yeah. And you know, Robert Downey is just like such a spectacular person. He's remained a very, very close friend of mine for yeah. all these years. So I would always do something with Robert if he needed me for something. And if that was Iron Man, then I'll, I'd be there. You heard it here first. <laughs> Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. You have a big birthday coming up? Yep. Do we have plans? Are you excited about it? Oh my gosh. Does it mean something to you? Is it just another birthday? I am so excited about it. First of all, I'm so surprised and delighted that I'm not freaked out about it. Because when I was turning 40, I was a mess. And so I thought, oh boy, 50 is going to be, it's going to feel, and I feel so good. Like, I'm so happy to be turning 50. I feel so grateful. I think I grieved a lot of the, the peace around, like, the physical part, you know, I think when you grow up in the culture very much and like pictures of you everywhere you, and you turn 40, people make such a big deal about it that you think like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm over the hill, like, and, and so there's a kind of grief and letting go of that youth in a way, but that I think also when I was turning 40, and I always say this like to my friends and my team, like I, I felt like, then I turned 40 and I got this amazing software upgrade, which really felt like, oh, this is actually kind of great. And like, I feel like I can be who I am a little bit more and I have permission. Totally. And now I feel like that times a hundred and I just feel like this is who I am. And I, I really like myself and I really know all of my flaws and I'm really working on them, but like, I'm okay being where I am and I'm okay being who I am. And so I'm excited to turn 50. I'm, I'm really excited about it, actually. Um, well, cool. I, th I think we're going to try out a product. Oh, great. Which has some relationship to morning television. I'm going to help you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Did you know about all this stuff before you started Goop? No. Were you into this? I mean, you were into skincare, but you didn't know. I was all the always into skincare. That's right. I didn't know what ingredients at you know are active at what level and that kind of thing. And like, what is the alternative, like the non-toxic alternative for, you know, X, Y, and Z. So that's been really fascinating to really like dive into the science and understand. It's pretty cool what you've done. Thank you. Kind you. of blown open a market, <laughs> haven't you? I mean, we're. I think we definitely helped kind of usher in the clean beauty movement and first in writing about it and before we made our own products and then um, I really did see like a white space there. I didn't see any luxury clean skincare and um, and so now we're just trying to make products that you know that are people's favorites and that they keep coming back and back for and so it's great. It's exciting. Well, congrats on Thanks. the big success of it. everyone and welcome to Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson once again. Coming up on the show, Bonnie Hunt. She's doing it all as director, writer, and executive producer of a new series out this week. We've got her visit with our third hour friends, plus Euphoria, the buzzy show about a group of troubled teens raked up 16 Emmy nominations this year. We spoke with the cast about how their characters evolved this season. And we'll wrap things up with the late, great James Caan from our vault on one of his most iconic films, Misery. But first, here's today's pop start with Jacob. Let's do some pop start. All right, first up, we've got an exclusive first look at the upcoming Princess Diana documentary, simply called The Princess. The film's going to give viewers an intimate look at Diana's life and how her relationship with Prince Charles came under intense scrutiny from the media and the public. Watch this. The princess has been the best thing that happened to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. The prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. This can be one question right She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Please. Leave them alone. Should this mean so much to us? Can't sweep her under the carpet. It's a cool spot doomed to continue. Wait. Intense, right? Ooh, I have anxiety. Amazing. I know. I can't wait to watch that one. So, Princess premieres on HBO the 13th of August. So, can't wait for that one. Coming up next, any Dawson's Creek fans? Yes. Raise your hand. I <laughs> love the Dawson's Creek. Uh, we got some news on a possible revival of the popular 90s teen drama that starred Katie Holmes and James Vanderbeek, Michelle Williams, Joshua Jackson. The news is, this is not fair, it's likely never going to happen. <laughs> Why did you bring it up? I don't know. I just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, Holmes was asked whether she would like to return to the role that made her a household name. She had some disappointing news for fans. This is what she said. I think it's great that you're nostalgic for it. So am I. But it's like, do we want to see them not at that age? Mm. I don't know. I don't think so. We all decided we don't, actually. Okay, there you go. Pretty That's definitive. Pretty definitive. I don't want to know what happened to them, like, as adults. Did you maybe? love Katie Holmes? Oh, my Come gosh. on. Yeah, yeah. Is that you your crush? crush. I would go that over your crush. I'd be like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, okay, next up, Lizzo. Uh, how was the show? It was an inc absolutely incredible. Fresh off uh, being here and her hit song about damn time, hitting number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The music superstar is revealing just how many times she recorded that song's chorus to make it perfect. She posted a TikTok video of the moment that she nailed it with members of her team celebrating. Check it out. Huh. The moment I finally figured out the chorus to about damn time. Let's celebrate. I got a feeling I'm gonna be okay. Okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Is that amazing? Oh, that's awesome. Is that amazing? That's so fun. she wrote in the caption, we literally had 50 versions of this song. I never thought we'd finish it, oh. but it was worth it. Can you imagine being in that room? Do you remember when she was here? I won't forget when she was greeting all the people in the crowd and this little girl looked at her and said, I love you, Lizzo. And Lizzo said, I love you. But do you love you? Oh. She said, yes. I was Whoa. like, I love that Lizzo. Oh She's amazing. Gosh. I bet that kid will never forget that moment. Yeah, I, had, I was texting all of you. I got had FOMO that day. That was yeah. like one of the good ones. Also, the here. entire yeah. album is great. Yeah. That is great. Album, yeah. every track. Well, if it wasn't enough, she also showed a video uh, showing off a bouquet of flowers, by the way, that Harry Styles <gasps> sent her way as a congratulations. Aww. About damn time, it actually surprised.
surpassed, dethroned as it was oh, on the Bill Oh, his song. Oh, that's okay. classic. I love Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, have you ever been watching Seinfeld? This is all about me, guys. <laughs> uh, and thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could have that marble rye bread or that famous big salad. Yeah. Well, now you can, thanks to the release of the official oh Seinfeld cookbook. No. Yes, it features recipes from some of the show's oh classic God. food moments, from the black and white yeah. cookie to the infamous soup Nazis, what? Mulligatani. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, 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 one Mulligatani, and, um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Al Pacino? You know, scent of a woman. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know something? <laughs> no soup for you! Come back! One year! One year. One year. Back. One year. No soup for you. Yosef was so excited for that one. I said Mulligatani. He's like, we're doing Seinfeld? Uh, you don't have to worry about following the soup Nazis rules because you can make the Mulligatani That's right awesome. at home. Wow. So October 11th, cool. the okay. cookbook comes out, so That's go pick fun. that one so up. Fun. Okay, last but not least, the most unexpected story of the morning. Aaron Rodgers <laughs> rolled in the Packers training camp this week looking like a movie, actually like a movie character. Look, here he is, walking into camp, rocking long hair, <laughs> oh. a beard, a white tank top, light blue jeans. Does he remind you of anybody? Nick Cage. Nick oh, Cage, Nick baby, Cage. Con Air. Packers fans and yeah. Nick Cage fans <laughs> caught on pretty quickly. He was channeling Cage's character, wow. Cameron Poe, right. from the 1997 Con Air. film Con Air. Yep. It was no coincidence. He posted photos of Cage on his own Instagram, too, so he did this on purpose, and it's not the first time he's done something like this. Last season, Rogers grew out his hair a lot, and it turns out it was for his Halloween costume. So he went as Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, complete with the dog and everything. So wow. he commits. He commits, he commits. yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, that's your pop that's star, it? guys. Yeah, I, want to hear I know, we're you like, want, we want more. more. Guys, can we get a couple more? So yeah. yeah. Well, way to go. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> We've got one more pop star story for you this morning. Get ready for more Ryan Gosling and The Gray Man. The Netflix action film may have just premiered on Netflix, but a sequel starring Gosling is already in the works from the same directors. Not only that, but it seems the streamer is trying to turn this into a whole sort of spy cinematic universe with a spin-off being worked on as well. The Gray Man follows Gosling's CIA agent character as he's hunted by assassins across the globe. Looks like audiences liked what they were seeing with a reported 88 million hours viewed over the weekend. That's a huge number for Netflix. And those are your Pop Start Plus headlines. Still to come, Bonnie Hunt's visit to the third hour. Stay with us. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Bonnie Hunt wears many hats in the new Apple TV Plus show Amber Brown. Executive producer, director, writer, and showrunner. And she dropped by the third hour to chat about the new project. 
Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screens. Ah, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical yeah. dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> and I can wear these PJs that dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, is <laughs> very sweet. Oh, I'm so excited. Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, you, and she's, Ashley. you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up. It's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and right, all right? of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a book series, as I mentioned. Uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air. Just, uh, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like my mom instilled in me and I it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series and I hope it touches it people. You talked a little bit about your mom we're so sorry to hear of your loss I know how close you are but I know that it was important to her for you to address family different mm. issues in family and would yeah. she have just love oh, this so much? Oh there's mom with is. her pies yeah um yeah, yeah. it you know I'm um I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But um yeah, I mean I'm I'm inspired by her constantly and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember mm -hmm. the ripple effect. Be mindful because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She's she is I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. She's well, adorable. You know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that I mean before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson so Rose cute. and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah was, she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because uh, we've got so <laughs> you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something When are you going to finally you? succeed? Oh, no, <laughs> Give me a break. What's going to stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical... Uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for a second mm. Mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was Return to Me which I wrote or all my 
talk shows or TV shows, whatever it is, my energy is, oh, can I have that effect on somebody at home right it's now? Escape, so, you right? do, it's you good. do. Man, it's oh, great to spend time with you. It's so Bonnie. great to see you here. Yes. Yeah, Bonnie, thank you so much. Everybody, Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV Plus this Friday. You gotta go check it out. Great to hear from Bonnie. Up next, Zendaya and her Euphoria castmates. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Today we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are back with a fan favorite. Euphoria did especially well with this year's Emmy nominations. The show tallied 16 in all, including a Best Actress nod for star Zendaya. We spoke to her and the rest of the cast about how their high school characters navigate addiction, identity, love, and more in the most recent season. I had to choose three words to describe euphoria. A lot of words that could describe euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen, it's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we use this season, which is also different, um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low. And when it's funny, it's really funny. And when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly and Jules isn't in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which is going to be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just want to be like cute couple, but you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls. She'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to want to be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her 
kind of make some hard decisions. And I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So, you slept over last night. Yeah. So, are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been, been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. What if these are like the big moments in life? Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. And I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that. But I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine. It is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge, to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again, because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces. So that's the gift that I've been given. It's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art in such a huge collaboration and every moving part, you know, it's just insane the scale of, of what we're doing. The tree. Uh, yeah, you know, you can't even put that feeling into words. It's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to, to me at least, and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this, this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. If you haven't watched or want to watch again, you can catch up on Euphoria on HBO. Still to come, we are remembering James Caan with a moment from our vault on one of his greatest films, Misery. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? I found a way to put the 
can you update us on the status of negotiations? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feels like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. The entertainment world was shaken when James Caan passed away earlier this month at the age of 82. Today, we'd like to remember his great acting legacy. He visited today back in 1990 to talk about his film, Misery, starred alongside Kathy Bates, who went on to win an Oscar for her performance. Over the years, the books of Stephen King have made for some pretty scary movies, among them The Shining, Carrie, Salem's Lot, Cujo, Firestarter, Creepshow. The latest edition of the list is called Misery. It opens nationwide this week. Our man in Hollywood, Jim Brown, says it brings together an unlikely mix of talents. If it were a true story, it would end up on the front pages of supermarket tabloids. Headline screaming, celebrity author terrorized by biggest fan. But it's only fiction. It's misery from the mind of best-selling novelist Stephen King and brought to the movie screen by writer William Goldman and director Rob Reiner. The romance novelist turned prisoner is James Caan, whose film credits include Cinderella Liberty, Funny Lady, Comes a Horseman, Gardens of Stone, and of course his Oscar-nominated performance as Sonny Corleone in the original Godfather. Kathy Bates plays his number one fan, nurse Annie Wilkes, who goes from sympathetic lifesaver to sociopathic demon. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. Please, Annie. Please. I think it was a sadistic joke by Rob. You know, he says, let's get the most hyper guy in Hollywood. <laughs> let's get Jimmy and tie him down, you know? You know, ha, 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 you know, every morning he would laugh. How, how about this scene you get in bed, Jimmy, you know? So, yeah, that's, that, it, it became, of all the, the pics I've done, and I've done a lot of physical things, you know, and I, but this was the most physical demanding, physically demanding uh, picture because of that, you know, because I was forced not to move. This subject of, uh, of the obsessive fan, have you ever encountered anything even remotely like this or known any actor who has? I've really not had... Uh, any anything remotely close to, to this or anything that touched on uh, on violence plus you know who's gonna fool around with Sonny Corleone you know what I mean that's the way they think. <laughs> hey what are you gonna do nice college boy yeah huh? they want to get mixed up in the family business huh? now you want to gun down a police captain why because he slapped you in the face a little bit huh what do you think this is the army where you shoot him a mile away you gotta get up close like this, and bing you blow their brains all over your nice side relief suit. James Caan was Sonny Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's masterful version of the novel The Godfather. Caan, along with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall, were nominated for supporting Oscars, but lost to Joel Grey in Cabaret. Caan also lost out for any chance to grow old with other members of the family when his character was killed off in spectacular fashion. Now, with Coppola's Godfather 3 due in theaters next month, Khan, who also worked for Coppola in The Rain People and Gardens of Stone, wished the movie maker well. Oh, I have nothing but well wishes for, for Godfather 3. You know, Francis uh, Coppola, of course, has been a friend for a long, long time. And uh, I always root for him. 
uh, I don't think they need much help. I don't think they need my wishes even. I think it'll be just great. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free. Meanwhile, James Caan has his own problems with the dilemma provided by Kathy Bates in Misery, which opens this week. Too much is to say that as they hope for an audience, Misery loves company. No, shouldn't do that. 56 pass. James Caan, such a legend. We're thinking of his family and his friends. That does it for this edition of Pop Start Plus. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us again tomorrow for more. We'll see you then. Today, all day, Hoda and I are so happy to be with you as we close out yet another week. We sure are, and welcome to our program today in 30. It's our half-hour wrap-up of everything from the show, and we get started with that flooding emergency happened in the South, a state of emergency declared for Kentucky. Complete coverage just ahead. And guys, you will not believe what happened a little earlier in our studio this morning. We had five people join us who share at least one thing in common. They are all survivors of mm. shark attacks. All of them happened in just the few week, last few weeks this mm -hmm. summer. They've got harrowing stories, good advice for anyone headed to the beach, and they're still smiling. Indeed, and then we're going to close out the show by introducing you to a remarkable camp for some really special kids. You don't want to miss it. So stick around, because it's time for Today in 30. And we've got two reports for you this morning. We're going to start with NBC's Maggie Vespa, who is there. Maggie, good morning. Savannah Hoda, good morning. As you said, we had some more rain overnight. Thankfully, the water is starting to recede. You can see down here. But look on this bridge just how high the water was 24 hours ago. All of that debris piled up here. And at the same time, we have some video of some of the worst damage in this area. And keep in mind, in spots that look like this, officials saying we experienced it yesterday, cell service, uh, cell service is almost completely wiped out. And that's a huge reason why officials say they're still getting inundated with missing person reports. One official telling us they were so swamped with rescues yesterday, they couldn't even begin to tally up the missing. Just noting, uh, quote, according to him, it's really high. At the same time, the state's governor is pleading with President Biden to send federal aid to the people here who have just lost so much. This is terrible. This is something I never thought I would dream of seeing. This morning across Kentucky, the depth of destruction from historic flash floods is coming into sharper focus as is a climbing death count. We've already lost at least eight, but I know there are many more than that. Kentucky is under a state of emergency. From above the town of Hinman, a look at the widespread damage with homes and businesses underwater. We still have no water, uh, sewer system is down. Uh, we're, we're totally shut down. Hinman's mayor telling us the flood has displaced and devastated many residents of this small community. Water rescues still underway to help people stranded. The National Guard stepping in to help by air and on the ground, along with other first responders. Just days before the first day of classes were set to begin, this school, heavily damaged by the storm, now filled with debris. In neighborhood after neighborhood, scenes of widespread ruin. Creeks and rivers overflowing into roads, now filled with murky waters. Some floodwaters even high enough to cover this bridge passing through the town of Garrett. A similar storm slamming St. Louis earlier this week. It was rising so quickly, it, it, we just weren't prepared for it. It's part of a wave of severe weather across the country this week. And overnight, storms fueling flash floods in Las Vegas. Strong wind gusts and heavy rains barreling down, even sending water pouring inside some casinos on the Strip. 
Back in Kentucky, officials say recovery efforts could take weeks or even years in the hardest hit places across the state. And while the cleanup is just beginning for so many, residents are staying positive despite losing so much. We'll make it. We always do with God's help. And again, just to reiterate, this is the bridge that we talked about in this piece, in that piece that the water was flowing over less than 24 hours ago. Kentucky's Governor Andy Bashir set to tour the damage from a chopper later on today. At the same time, large swaths of the state remain under a flood warning this morning. People here praying it doesn't get worse. Savannah? Just devastating. Maggie, thank you very much. Ms. Maggie just said the flood threat is ongoing. So let's turn to Samar Theodore from weekend today at our NBC station in D.C. for more on this forecast. How does it look for them. This is a dire situation, yeah. Savannah and Hoda, and unfortunately, we have more rain on the way. So here's the latest. Right now, we have eastern Kentucky. Good morning, eastern Kentucky. If you live in Jackson, Hazard, you all are under a flash flood warning. So that means that it's imminent. Where we see the green, that's where we have the flash flood, or I'm sorry, the flood watch. Now, here's the latest on the radar. The good news is we're getting a little bit of a reprieve here as the showers are starting to lighten up in Kentucky. And here's the interesting thing. We're actually seeing this boundary start to sink to the south. That means as we head through Friday night into your Saturday, showers and thunderstorms are going to start to move into areas like Tennessee, areas like northern Georgia, good morning Huntsville, into northern Alabama and Jackson, Mississippi. But unfortunately, that break for Kentucky is short-lived because the rain then moves back up with this boundary shifting to the north, bringing more showers and storms in on your Sunday. So as far as totals go, we could see one to three inches of rain, but locally we could see six inches of rain or more. Again, this is a dire situation for eastern Kentucky. A little bit of a break tomorrow, but the rain returns again on Sunday. Meanwhile, the countdown is on to tonight's Mega Millions drawing with more than one billion with the B dollars up for grabs. Yeah, after months without a jackpot winner, it has now become the third largest prize in history. NBC's Jacob Sobaroff is among the many. He's got a big dream and I'm sure a ticket in his pocket. Hey, Jacob. I'm trying, Hoda. Good morning, you guys. Just about everybody has lottery fever. I think it's fair to say this morning that massive jackpot up to a billion, $1.1 billion. If you go for the lump sum, you're going to take home 648 million bucks. It is hard to comprehend. And that's after Uncle Sam takes his big cut, of course. But if you got two bucks to spare, all that money could be yours. It's the moment everyone is dreaming about. It's right here. Brent Fulton's gonna be a billionaire. Wishing and praying they have the lucky ticket to a billion dollar jackpot. When you have that kind of money, you know, everything's possible. And with tonight's drawing, you'll have your chance. A one in 303 million chance. Cameron and his wife Donna beat those staggering odds when he played and won a quick pick in New York back in 2014. So my wife, she was like, quit playing on that work, quit playing. I know it's a joke. So to put the clerk on the phone, she was like, no, your husband, he really did. You guys won $20 million. A new house and a few cars later, Cameron says he's still the same husband, dad, and now granddad. But his advice? Stay humble. Get you a financial advisor and get you a lawyer. And experts say that's the most important move, getting a team of trusted advisors in place. And then don't forget to document that you are the owner of that golden ticket. I would take a selfie with it. I would take a video of the ticket and me smiling. Uh, I wouldn't post it on Instagram or any other site. You really want to keep this as private as possible. Robert Pagliarini is a wealth advisor who's worked with lottery winners. He says the next step is coming up with a plan. So you can take your sudden wealth and turn it into lasting wealth. And for many winners, big or small, part of that plan is giving back. Crystal Dunn was sitting at her computer earlier this month playing a Kentucky lottery online game when suddenly... I bet a $20 bet and all of a sudden it said jackpot. $146,000 to be exact. And the first thing she did, pay it forward. I got this unexpected gift. I just want to make sure that... I just want to do something unexpectedly nice for other people. One by one, she handed out $100 gift cards to 20 strangers at her local grocery store. An act of kindness that she hopes others will follow. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? 
Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It has been a season filled with sightings close to shore and even attacks. More than 20 in the U.S. so far. So the question is, what would you do if you came face to face with a shark? Well, we actually have a few people right here on our couch who could answer that question. Each and every one of them survived a recent shark attack. Lindsey Bruns is with us, Zach Gallo, John Mullins, Sean Donnelly, and Max Haynes. Guys, welcome. Uh, Lindsey, let's start with you. Everyone was bitten by a shark. You, I think, had the worst injuries of all. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, we were on the water. It was a beautiful day on the water, perfect, no wind, and just enjoying the day. And then on the way back, because we were in the Florida Keys, kind of <laughs> at a sandbar that was out in the middle, mm -hmm. we decided to jump off the boat. And we, me and my girls Your were jumping off the yeah. boat. Mm -hmm. And um, this particular time, I guess I landed on the shark, and he just bit, bit me, mm. but then he left which was wow. great. Wow. And so when I came up, I couldn't feel my legs, and I just looked at my husband and said, help, and he jumped in and rescued me. Your injuries were pretty severe. Did I understand? You have like, you're five feet tall. You have like three feet of stitches. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Wow. Um, and so we were kind of far from land, about 20, 25 minutes, and so he had to tie a tourniquet. Oh, my God. The anchor rope. Oh, and, my goodness. And head in. And so once I arrived, the paramedics were there, and um, I took a trauma helicopter. They were able to give me a blood transfusions while I was there. Ugh. And then I had 11, I think, that first surgery. Oh, oh my, my gosh. <laughs> well, let's talk about Zach and John. You guys are next to each other. This is such a strange coincidence, but each of you was bitten by a shark. You're both lifeguards, but you happen to have been out in the ocean playing a victim in the, as you guys were doing drills and when you were playing the victim the shark got you yeah so uh at smith point i work at smith point uh and um we do training exercises every day to mimic rescue scenarios and i was the victim at that you were time splashing around like you're i was just treading water yeah uh, waiting for my rescuer to come get me and I, all of a sudden i'm i feel just like the sharp pressure in my hand um i try to pull my hand and something's attached to it so okay. i rip and basically just start Hammer punching. You punched the, the shark? Yeah, I, I connected with it three times. And then on the third time, it tail whipped me uh, and swam away. And it was that moment. I'm like, we're dealing with a shark here. So, got, you know, get to shore, get to shore. Oh, my gosh. And uh, just swam in as fast as I could. Something similar happened to you, John. You were yeah. doing lifeguard training. You don't know each other. This mm -hmm. is, you're nearby each other. So what happened in your story? All right, so I was about like 100, 100 for the yards off the shore. And I was just treading water for maybe five to 10 minutes. And I was, as, soon as, as soon as my rescuers got there, that's when I got bit. I felt the mouth around my foot. I pulled out. I just started kicking. I don't know if I connected. The adrenaline was rushing, but I didn't feel it anymore, and that's when I swam the shore. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, you know what? It seems interesting. Like, you guys were you were on a sandbar, and it happened with you, Max, too. Were you close to a sandbar? Is that what was happening? So I was very close. I was about 15 yards out, like, right at the break, and I was just sitting there on my surfboard with my friend. Didn't see anything coming, and then just felt like jaws on my foot and it just bit down real hard. I thought it broke my foot, but uh, I was able to get away. I guess it let go mm. pretty quickly. I mean, it, it just, I, the shock you must feel. I what about you, Sean? How, yeah. did, how did it happen to you? Yeah, I was surfing before work. Um, I paddled out like seven in the morning. Uh, I was maybe in the water for 25 minutes, surfed a couple waves. Um, 
I was actually going to get a, the next group of waves. So I was paddling prone, going to get the next wave. Uh, as soon as I got a couple strokes off the sandbar I was on, uh, I got hit once on the board. Enough force knocked me into the water. Oh. When I fell into the water, I saw the fin. And I was like, oh, no, this is shark attack. Um, what, what, do I, what do I do now? Yeah. But thankfully, I had my surfboard, and I was back on my board before I knew it. The shark came up on the right side of the board. I was able to slap it once. And thankfully, there was some waves coming in, and I just turned around and piled as hard as I could for sure, and it took me right to the beach. I can't imagine the fear that you guys went through when you were in the water, and I can't imagine, quite frankly, wanting to go back in the water ever again after something like, like that happened. Lindsay, for you, did you go back in? Have you been back in? Um, well, the rest of the vacation was spent in the hospital, so yeah. I haven't had a chance yeah. yet, but I... I I plan to go back in. And your girls, yeah. too, who witnessed yes, it? Yes, yeah. they were already back in in a few days. Mm -hmm. so. Was this something you guys were worried about? I mean, shark attacks? Is yeah. that something that had crossed your mind? You joked about it. Yeah. <laughs> when you're playing victim, you're sitting out there. Well, you had heard about his yeah. scenario, right? Because yeah. it happened just a few weeks before the exact same thing yeah, happened to you. a couple days before mine, and we joked about it. Yeah. And it's funny how it got bit. But I thought I was fine because <clears throat> that got bit at the same beach I was at, and I figured on the it's odds, like lightning like, doesn't yeah. strike twice. Yeah. So, so yeah. never so, gonna happen. So yeah. what is the advice? I mean, people are swimming out in the ocean. You guys said you punched at the shark just out of sheer adrenaline. Yeah. But what's the right thing to do? I think uh, the number one thing, if you do decide to go into the ocean, make sure you're going into an area that is protected by lifeguards, uh, because you know. God forbid there is an emergency yeah. situation like a shark attack. You you have trained personnel that can handle that situation. Um, you know, you go to the beach, ask the lifeguards, you see any fins today? You know, hopefully not. You know, mm -hmm. we haven't seen any sharks since we've been back on, since I've been back at work. Um, but yeah. I mean, it seems like an obvious question. If a shark bites you, it hurts. In that moment, are you just in shock, mm -hmm. or did, do you really yeah. feel it? Do you even realize I what's happening to you? I didn't really feel it till I was back on shore, and I looked at my foot, and it was covered in blood, and that's oh, when mm -hmm. I knew it was like a shark attack. Yeah. And I didn't you, even know until. And you guys obviously love the ocean, love the water. This year, everyone's talking about that there are more sharks out there than ever before. Is that what you guys have been experiencing and seeing, even like on the job? Yeah, uh, everyone. Yeah. Everyone asks, is there a shark spotting today? Really? Yeah. There's always, it's always a yes. Wow. <laughs> what about our surf? You, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know this is like a risk. Surfers yeah. always seem to be attractive to sharks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely always had a game plan in my head, like, God forbid it ever happens, you know, what what can you do? You know, I think when you're surfing, at least you have a little bit of protection. You have the board, you have flotation. You know, like, my board got hit first, then my leg got bit. Mm. And I didn't feel it until I got up the beach. So, you know, I, I think... You know, just having an idea of your head of like what you do, God forbid it happens, I think helps you. Well, we're happy that you all are here with us on the couch. Lindsay, we're very happy that you're okay. That must have been completely scary. And we're happy that your girls are all right, too. So, yeah, are you expecting to make a full recovery? Yes, um, I'm already progressing a lot faster than everyone thought. Wow. Well, the guys all think you're the <laughs> toughest one here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thank you. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. 
I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Okay, guys, we're back with one of our favorite segments because for a change, we don't have to ask the questions. We are going to answer them. It's Q&A today, your opportunity to ask us anything. And the first one, actually, Jill, why don't you take it? It's okay, from okay. Rachel. What's the best thing you've done this summer and what's still left on your list? Best thing you've done this summer. Mm. You know, honestly, I'm getting married in the fall. Yeah. And it's when you get married later in life, it's really about your family and about everybody mm. else. So it's watching people pick their dress and watching my mother's face when I went to my dress fitting, which of Aww. course I waited too late. She was crying there. She's Look not going to work there. I showed this picture. But also, my stepdaughter asked me to go, one of my stepdaughters, I have two, and a stepson, she asked me to go with her to get her dress. This is Georgia. Aww. And it was so important to me, you know, and you know, because Absolutely. when you come from a blended family, family. It's, yes. it's very, um, it's, it was very meaningful to me. So, and what I'm looking forward to is um, my fitting and oh, marrying the love of my life. So, that's so, that's yeah. awesome. That was a good that's one. Good. Okay, so next up, it's your turn. Okay. Okay, let's get this question from Kelly. What are your favorite day trips in the area to take your kids to? Oh. Ooh, favorite day trips. Hmm. It's kind of changing as my kids are getting a little older. I used to be able to take them to like the Lego store and let them like run around. Um, now my 13 year old is super into anime. So if I take him to like a ramen place, he's like the happiest person on earth. Um, Clara likes to go to the art store. I sent her in there yesterday and she got like a canvas and paints and she loves it. Oh, and cool. then my little guy, he'll walk with me to a bodega on the corner. He just likes to, oh. he's the last child that still holds my hand. Like when we like cross the street, that? I just I'm like don't let go because right. I know that he's the last one. Right. Let go. Like, hold on anyway, all right. So it's now, little things. I know. All right, now uh, a question from Tara. Jacob, you should take this. Okay. One. All right. What are your recommendations for my summer reading list? Summer reading list. I just read a book. This might be heavy, but it's called Exit West. It's a book about uh, refugees. It was recommended mm. to me at a wedding I was at. Actually, it's a novel. I don't read a lot of fiction, um, but I found it fascinating, and I can't stop reading it's good. it. And also, my pal Katie Turr wrote a memoir. It's really, really good. It's called Rough Draft. You should read that too. You're a good friend. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> a good Do you have oh, time good. to read? I know. Not but... much. I don't read that much, but I found myself wanting to have a book in my in my hand this sure. summer, and it feels good. so good, doesn't it? You know it's what good. I started with those audio books because that I feel helps. like that if you're just walking it helps because I don't feel like I carve out time to yeah. read. Okay. That's good. Uh, Jill Ellen I think has a question for you. Okay. Okay. I have a very very important question. White, red, or rosé? Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. I all mean, of them? I, all of them. I, I My drink of choice though um, in addition to Kathy Lee's gift one. Mm -hmm. it, my gift of choice is um my gift of choice. My drink of choice is a dirty martini, like really dirty with extra olives. That's mm, what. That sounds thing. like. Would you like that? Uh, margarita is my margarita. thing. Yeah. Have you had orange wine? No. It's good. Mm. Is it infused with actual orange? No, I don't syrup? know what. I have no idea. I'm not a sommelier, but uh, <laughs> it was good. It's orange wine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, Chanel, you're up next. Catherine has okay. a question. Hi. My question is, where is the favorite place that you've traveled with the show? Ooh, okay, I have a couple of them. Yeah, you know what? The pr producer asked me this yesterday. Now I see why. Okay, so my first one was. <laughs> That's because we're doing this segment. Yeah, Scotland was so much fun. That was my first big That's international trip with the show. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we had so much fun. I went with Al, and it was a rush trip. We got to Scotland, and it's so funny because then there was a big storm or something happening here in New York City. So Al had to leave me, and they were like, "We got to find you a new co-host from Scotland." And I'm like, "What?" And guess who it ended up being? Oh. It ended up being Kier. And that was the oh. first time I met Kier. We've been buddies That's ever since. That's so great. And then the second one was the royal wedding. I found this picture in my phone. It's actually a video where we were waiting for, this is, I'm on the side. I'm holding up my iPhone. You took this? We were, yeah. We were waiting for Harry and Meghan to ride by. Oh, we just cut it off. Well, in the video, Harry and Meghan drive by and they wave. And that was it. When you see that, isn't it amazing? There it is. Here we go. Here we go. They're coming. I can't is believe it? how cool our job is. Yeah, look at that. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. And then there, that Did was they say, it. hey, Chanel. And you know, I almost missed it on the show. Like, because I was so busy, like, trying to get it on my own phone. I'm like, oh, wait, this is my job. Yeah. Anyway, it's all right. amazing. Do we have time Pretty for cool. any more? Oh, yeah. uh, womp womp. Well, thanks, <laughs> Michelle and Nick, for trying. 
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Yeah. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's time to bring you just the good news. It's the season for summer camps, and New York Live Entertainment correspondent Joelle Gargiulo got to take us to an awesome one in Long Island. Yeah. Hi, Hi guys. <laughs> I have to tell you, it is not just any camp. It is called Camp Anchor, and it is for kids with special needs. And I have to say, the minute I got there, I could feel the love and joy, not just from the campers, but also the staff and volunteers who make it happen year after year. Take a look. If you've ever spent a day at Camp Anchor, describing it comes easy. The greatest place on earth. Love. Camp Anchor is happy. If you can't already tell, there's an energy in the air, an infectious spirit. The minute the children and the adults get off the bus, it's, it's pure joy. They can let their guard down. They can just be themselves. They have different disabilities, but the abilities they shine. Camp Anchor staff and its 275 volunteers Let's go, Joe. spend their six weeks of summer leading and teaching over 750 campers, all with special needs. This is my 32nd summer. What do you love about it? Uh, it's the kids. It's just coming down here and seeing their smiles that really kind of change your, your perspective of things, makes you realize what's important. What's the age range of campers? Um, six to whenever. Look, he's like, he's a hug. You can stay until you want. Give me an idea of day to day, what happens here? You can have dance, you have sports, fitness, drama, home ec. Anchor has been serving this Long Island, New York community for over 50 years. It's a special bond here, and it truly is, and in the words of these campers, a magical place to be. And its heart lies with its campers, like 11-year-old Gavin Sands, who was born with Down syndrome. Gavin is truly our greatest joy. He's our fourth child. Camp Anchor is a place where I know that he's safe, He's given so many opportunities to shine and to build his confidence. We feel happy, we feel blessed and grateful. The things he does here empowers him to, to see that he can, he can do anything. And for the Sands, Camp Anchor is a family affair. I've been working here for six years. This is my second summer here. This is my first summer. What is it like when you see your brother at camp? I love seeing Gavin at camp. I always run up to him and give him a hug. It's so nice to be in a place where we're all together and Gavin's so accepted and it's so inclusive. This camp inspires so many people to like go into the special education field as their profession. I'm actually becoming a special education teacher, so I want to be here literally for the rest of my life. When Gavin comes home and you say, okay, tell me about your day today at Camp Anchor, What's a typical response? I have the best day ever, and that's every day. Days that Gavin and his volunteer buddy Katya enjoy. Can I hang with you? Yes, let's go. Filled with music. Get your jumps up. Some animal yoga. 
And the main event, surfing. How do you feel when you're on the surfboard? I feel happy. To know that your son has a place like this to go to, what does that mean to you both? It's like he's, he's family from the very day he got here. It's like him being home. I mean, this is home for them. Anchor is my second family. Yeah, I swear! You come here and you just have that feeling of, I'm accepted. You know, I'm allowed to be here. There's a quote when you come in that reads, to the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. And I think that just captures the essence of this beautiful camp that allows these campers to form incredible friendships, not only with other campers, but with the staff, the volunteers, the administration, and they form these friendships and memories that they'll treasure forever. Okay, so right now it costs $130 for six weeks. And now the, the former accountant in me wants to point out that's about $22 a week. Okay, and it's available for people of the town of Hempstead, but I spoke with the town supervisor and their hope is to expand this so every town has a camp like Camp oh, Anchor. It's amazing, I mean, Joelle. Yeah, you talk about life changing, but you make a good point. It's not just life changing for the campers. Yeah, it's the volunteers, yeah. it's the people who work there summer after summer. It was the most incredible day, and I'm just I'm thrilled that I got it's to spend a day there. Wow, that was a beautiful camp. story. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. Be sure to join us starting on Monday. We're kicking off another big week on today. So we'll see you then. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they were like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, 
I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing. Don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said a what? <laughs> I said a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, were, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was only here till 3 o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50-something. Mm -hmm. And the next day I make $80-something. And I said, OK, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Jerk chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah. That? I'm so glad uh, you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Fun Billy always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You got to show right. me how to cut this meat. Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Just yeah. chicken and ox there. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a bee. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. 
isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> Right. The, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the chop, Mr. Hall. Oh, Han. yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper, mm. also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call Yava Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burn sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last, give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up, make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You know, normally if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh yeah. You see you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't cook. It smells it. smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh now we're talking. For you to taste. I came to Austin. The result truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I had my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I got to try that. Oh, that's a great press. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pots? Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? 
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not going to even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand. Working, ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam. Anne turning to cooking to help support the family. Okay. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi vượt biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn nhưng mà qua được cái ấy rồi toàn tụ gia đình thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp lại mặt chồng con hết, thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. 
the family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. I asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hái à hép với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. <cười> thì lại giờ cho, cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish will add to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have it pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and pho at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes, um, and that is because of the you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, this tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha 
announced it. When it opened in 2013, Habasha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, it's you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was uh, one who hooked me up. To him, so. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open a restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartar. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. There's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I uh, think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only 3 or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food is not takeout, so we had to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot, and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry, I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just. Uh, 
the love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she, she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do, he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard award-winning chefs and taqueros and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Good morning. State of emergency. Catastrophic flooding across the south, leaving entire neighborhoods underwater this, this morning. Terrible. This is, I mean, this is something I never thought I would dream of seeing. Crews in Kentucky still trying to reach areas cut off by the rising water. At least eight people killed, others still missing, and more rain falling this morning. We've got a full report and your full forecast. Recession 